I'm called Stephen Bailey. Uh, I was responsible for creating London's Influential Design Museum. Um, but before that, I worked in the Victorian Albert Museum, putting on exhibitions about design. But crucially, before that, I was, of course, working for the Open University. I said, always excited by the idea of modern architecture and design, but before A305, the, the literature was actually, it wasn't particularly, it wasn't particularly well researched, and it wasn't particularly, it wasn't particularly well organised. And to be able to participate in this was marvellous. But what I, what I discovered, I mean, the, the simple truth was, I mean, Tim Benton had understandably marshaled all the Open University's amazing resources in media and in print and electronic and uh, visual and video media. Um, and he wanted to make a true and compelling record of classic modern architecture. So, so Tim did Bruno Taut, went to the Hufeisen Siedlung, for instance. Tim did Le Corbusier, Tim did Frank Lloyd Wright, and all the glorious masterpieces of you know, high modern architecture. It sort of fell to me to do more humble things like cinemas in Finsbury Park in North London, or the Garden City in Letchworth in, you know, in Hertfordshire, or something interesting, but frankly a bit mundane, like you know, mechanical services. Did I think my role in A3FI was to be a sort of forward-looking critic? I mean, I think, yeah, that's sort of fair enough. But I need to explain it in perhaps a broader context. I mean, before I started working on A305, um, I had myself been a student of the history of art. And the history of art is really, uh, is, um, really my subject. But I decided, even as an undergraduate, that the, the only purpose of studying the history of art was to be able to apply principles of the past to the present and to the future. I mean, I had a, I had a personal insight in Manchester, where I first studied. You know, somebody was teaching me about Italian Baroque altarpieces, which I love. You know, I'm, I'm as fond of Annie Billy Calacci as, any, as anybody else is. But I was thinking in Manchester, you know, the typical industrial city, I was thinking, why on earth is someone telling me about Baroque altarpieces in Italy when they should be telling me about, you know, the world outside in Manchester and what Manchester is all about in those days? I'm talking 50, 40, nearly 50 years ago. The study of architectural history was very primitive. It just wasn't there. The materials simply didn't exist. So getting on to A305, it sort of it validated a lot of my interests. I was brought into a world where, you know, hitherto I had been a, a sort of supplicant young student at the feet of Rainer Bannum and Joseph Rickford and Tim Benton, and suddenly I was these people's, I was their, their colleague. I was used my part of A305 to talk about ideas about design and how design you know, it can be understood not just historically, but is a, is a, is a, is a you know, is a rationale for um, present and future existence. Unless architecture can address everyday needs of people, which is ordinary housing, it, it seems to me to be uh, less important than if it's all about monuments. This is why the great Martin Pauli's book, Architecture and Housing, was certainly such an influence on me, and I think a lot of other um, young people. Pauli, inspired by aircraft and machinery, but also by um, a certain rather, rather curious, eccentric personal vision, really, really believed that you know, just getting the, getting the design of a house right, or an apartment right, and using, uh, using uh, machinery and factories as inspiration, um, this was, you know, what the architect's proper calling was, and Pauli was well, uh, who wasn't, alas, directly involved in A305, as I recall. Martin Pauli uh, represented, at least for me, one of the high points of you know, intellectual quality in architectural writing. He felt that, you know, yeah, the purpose of, you know, the purpose of archi well, yeah, architecture could really be tested, not by the quality of architecture could be tested not by the glamour and grandeur of great monuments, but by the utility of a simple, a simple residence. And this is why you know, architecture versus housing was, at the time, um, such an influential book. I actually look forward one day to reading it again and seeing, seeing how much I agree. But yeah, I mean, Martin, Martin brought um, a very high standard of intellectual scrutiny to the, which hitherto hadn't existed, to the study of housing. So much of the history of architecture, at least in this country, had been hitherto sort of anecdotal and more like belles lettres, more like essays. But you know, Martin Pauli understood mechanics, he understood machinery, he understood structures, which is quite rare amongst architectural critics. And um, 
I think it was just one of the great books, you know, reforming and visionary and humane, but of course beautifully written too. Here we are, Bannum did, Dan did mechanical services, and I wrote something about you know, the modern flat. And I, looking back now, I'm just amazed at the sort of stuff I did. I really know about this, about the Garshi system of waste disposal or the Mopin system of uh, you know, making concrete structures. But you know, the context of A3FI was so exhilarating and so exceptional. I, as a young postgraduate student, I threw myself completely threw myself into becoming an expert on the modern flat. I abandoned my own PhD thesis and instead, after Tim Benton's invitation, decided to become instead an expert on you know, the modern flat and the housing problem. And I had all the resources of the Open University and all the time in the world to do it. I've always been interested in vernacular things, ordinary things. My definition of excellence is the ordinary thing done extraordinarily well. Um, and the flat, talking about typologies, I mean, the humble working man's flat, what the Germans called existence minimum, here is the perfect test for your ideas about design. Can you make a modest dwelling beautiful and useful? And I'm, I'm still hugely motivated by that. So the, you know, the modern flat was that. I just wanted to look at you know, new typologies and see how, um, see how design worked. But most of all, and I still got something of the missionary, well, yeah, I got a lot of the missionary spirit, which came with A305, and I carried the missionary spirit through to the design museum. The only point in being interested in design is that you should be able to make the everyday world into a more useful and beautiful place. As I said, the, the, actual, the actual study of architectural history 40 years ago was much more primitive than it is today. And the study of 20th century architectural history was very primitive indeed. I mean, we had to go, you know, photo, many of the, I didn't go to Vienna, that's, that's Karl Marx's, uh, that's um, Karl Ains, um, Karl Marx, Karl Marxhof. But, uh, you know, these photographs didn't exist in photo libraries. I actually had to go out in my car with my Yashica twin lens reflex camera, you know, and take these, you know, and take these pictures myself. You know, it was, I'm just trying to uh, give you some sort of impression of the extraordinary zeal and effort which went into the creation of A305. It was marshalling all this, you know, this, this diverse material and putting it into one coherent set of knowledge saying this is, you know, modern design. And I have to confess and concede that, it, you know, so intense was the experience. And I was only working there for two years. Um, so intense was the experience. I mean, I still have that feeling that this E305 is the authoritative, scriptural, biblical account of what modern architecture is. The, the Garden City. In some of these photographs, you can even see my own little Fiat 128. Part, yeah. I had to take the pictures myself because you know, at this stage of the course is history. We'd run out of budget for, you know, for, um, for photographers. But again, that's, um, you know, that was part of the, um, you know, part, of the um, part of the story. I've always been interested in the suburbs because uh, I have a taste for you know, the vernacular, uh, the, the ordinary thing. I don't think the, um, I don't think we should disdain the suburbs. Uh, and of course, a lot of a lot of high modern, you know, a lot of high modernists, of course, of, you know, of course, did. Um, uh, there's a there's a there's a prejudice against against um, the suburbs, but actually, it's just like everybody hates the middle class because you know, the, I, mean, I mean, the aristocrats and the extremely wealthy hate the middle class, and the and the and the and the, the less well off hate the middle class. Everybody hates the suburbs, you know, you know for the, for the same reason. But you know, somebody once said that the the the, the design of an ordinary house is at the outer limits of human capability. And I actually do think that. And so we just wanted, you know, you know in, in a little bit of a heterodox way in the context of a course about modern architecture and design to look at, you know, to look at the suburbs. Because I think it's often said, that certainly in the context of England, that, you know, that the, the creation of suburbs, the best suburb, particularly the garden, the, the garden suburbs, this is actually Britain's unique contribution to the history of world architecture. I mean, much, of, much else of what's happened in in Britain with architecture has been 
to an extent derivative or even copied from, you know, from other European examples. But the Garden City is our British, Britain's unique contribution to uh, the history of architecture. So that, that seemed to me to be a, something worth saying in the context of, um, of A305. And was sort of mildly heterodox as well, because at the time, you know, the settled opinion was that um, uh, the, the, the Corbusian approach to housing was probably wiser than the, you know, than the Garden City one, or certainly more, more agreeable to fashionable architects. But of course now, I mean, government policy in England, Britain, is um, coming around to promoting Garden Cities again, although not, I hope not in a derivative style. Well, I've always been... I've always been fascinated by the idea of uh, historicism. I'm inclined to think that history is, uh, is a continuous process and everything is to a degree a reference to something else. The pursuit of novelty is, a, is, is, is unique novelty, is fascinating, but I think a delusion. And of course that's, one, that's something which characterizes the, whole, the, the modern movement. They, they, they felt they were, they, they felt final solution is not a happy expression, but they felt their they were determining the final solution for architecture. And of course, they weren't, but which makes it elegiac and charming. And so we looked at we looked at questions of um, historicism. How there's Belgiozo, Pelasuti, and Rogers, their famous Tolly of Alaska in Milan, and you know, does this have a relationship to you know, um, you know, um, to Gaudi? Does um, does look at, uh, does I uh, know Goldfinger's Trellick Tower in London? Was this possibly influenced by Saint Elia? Who'd just been rediscovered as, um, you know, Santelli was one of those interesting people like uh, Vermeer and El Greco, who, who after a, a prodigious creative period, went into a total obscurity, but was then rediscovered. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite clearly, it's quite clear that Erno Goldfinger had been looking at Santelli. So the idea of historicism, which of course I borrowed from Nikolaus Pevsner, another, another hero of mine. Um, yeah, it seems to be necessary to the, you know, to the understanding of architecture, because things don't exist actually even though architects sometimes believe they do. Things don't exist de novo. They are just always, you know, that's what, that's what studying the history of art teaches you. you know, the antique gods aren't dead. They still survive. They've just taken, taken different forms. You know, looking back at A305 now, it's like looking back at the whole phenomenon of, you know, modernism. You know, modern we, we can now see as a historical style label, you know, almost as precise as Baroque and Rococo. That's not to diminish it. It's in, on the contrary, it's to, it's, to, it's to elevate it. But these people felt they were they felt they were finding finding absolute truth in design. They felt they had found timeless answers to the questions of building design. They hadn't. Uh, that doesn't make it less noble and less fascinating, uh, because their inspiration was of the very very highest moral and often of aesthetic order. Uh, but it's a moment which is now past.